It's six oh five. I think we should um, call this meeting to order, and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United America. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. Thank you. And now we have to appoint a new district pro district clerk pro temp, which is Terry Howard. Can I get a motion? Motion. Can I get okay. a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Terry. Did you get the um, motion in the second? The second, who was the second? Second was Destiny. Destiny. Oh, Hollenbeck. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, and then now we're gonna give um, a moment for a student video introduction. So I'd like to turn it over to Kate Gerard to introduce the video. Thank you so much. Um, whether or not you guys know it, March has been officially designated by the National Association for Music Education as Music in Our Schools Month. The Music in Our Schools celebration began in New York State on one day in 1973. New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller acknowledged Music in Our Schools Day with a proclamation that stated, this observance is designed to bring about a more genuine recognition in New York State of the vital place of music in the educational process. Music is a powerful aesthetic force. It brings spirit and joy into the life of every individual. It dignifies the realm of feeling by merging intellect and emotion in the search of a humane way of life. It strengthens international and racial bonds. The proclamation also stated, it is fitting for New York to recognize music in our schools as an essential part of the learning process. We must continue to encourage and support this significant art form, which, as it moves more deeply into the core of education, becomes a powerful single channel into the innermost feelings and responses of every child. By 1985, Music in Our Schools Month had grown into, or Music in Our Schools Day had grown into a month long national celebration of school music with the purpose to raise awareness of the importance of music education for all children and to remind citizens that school is where all children should have access to music. While this year is quite different, we're going to continue sharing with our schools and the community the work our students are doing in, and the academic and expressive benefits that school music brings to students of all ages. We are always grateful for your continued support of our students. Thank you so much. And Samantha McShane prepared the national anthem with the sixth grade chorus to share with you right now. And I think Sam's on the call, so appreciate everyone's yeah. effort in the music department. And I'll go ahead and let you listen. Awesome, Kate. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Um, Thank you. 
Awesome. I'd like to see a little more of that in the future. That that was cool. You probably see how uh, that's an example of um, how our music classes um, have had to socially distance um, 12 feet uh, to meet the guidelines. So a little challenging for our music staff this year, but as always, they, uh, they rock it. So thank you. Thank you. Great. We'll uh, move uh, to uh, approval of the present agenda. Can I get a motion to motion. approve the present? Second. Second. Beth and Muriel. Yep. And uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 And we open it up to public comment. Um, I just want to remind the public that this is being recorded as usual. And uh, if anybody from the public has a question, you can simply raise your hand. All right, I see no hands. So we'll move along to uh, board member comment. Any board members have any comment? Matt, Matt, Matt has a comment. I yeah, see your hand. Two, two quick ones. Um, one, um, first of all, I'm, I'm really heartened by this um, donation that we've got wrapped up in, uh, in consensus agenda because it was a business agreement. Can we, can we share the dollar amount? Yeah, it's all public. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, five thousand dollars from the Silent Pantry of uh, of Ghent uh, for uh, emergency family assistance, and uh, it's a, uh, you know, it. I, I know um, some of us are really looking forward to full reopening, and we're looking at return to normalcy. But there's a lot of families that um, things are really still not feeling normal. Um, so, that's really great. Um, and the second thing is, um, I've heard some feedback already on um, some positive feedback on um, uh, potential changes to, uh, you know, our density guidelines in the school. So looking forward to that as well. That's it. Uh, I just want a shout out um, to, to Judy Matthews, who's uh, on the call as an attendee and, and Mike Chuddy, who once we were approached, um, worked out all the details um, in terms of um, working with our external auditor to make sure we had this fund set up appropriately a committee to evaluate the request and make sure that we're, you know, everything is handled. Uh. <coughs> yes, no, this was a great thing. Ted, Ted physically had his hand up. So uh, right. go ahead, Ted. Matt took some of the air out of my balloon there. I'd like to acknowledge both Chatham Pantry and Hudson Bank for humbling donations. Thank you so much. Beth also has her hand up, Craig. Beth has her hand up. Go ahead, Beth. Okay, quick question. So is it the Ghent Food Pantry or the Chatham Food Pantry? Chatham. Okay, I thought somebody had said the Ghent Silent, and I was going to say... Uh, I apologize. That was a mistake. Okay, I, I, I just kind of wrapped it up. Though I will say that Chatham, um, the Ghent Food Pantry, has done something similar because... The retired teachers donated that to them a large sum of money back in December or November, and they were able to give everybody who got a Christmas basket um, an extra um, a food card to Price Chopper to cover a lot of their you know grocery expenses. Um, just and again, I, I, I thank you. I was just looking. Judy had. Uh, made a comment in the, uh, I'm not used to using the questions and answers, but she had brought to our attention that it was the Chatham area silent pantry. And I brought the resolution that you'll be re, uh, approving or accepting the donation is on the screen now, just to make sure we, we get that correct. The Chatham pantry works with the Chatham Lions Club very closely as well. And the, their example, though quiet, is exemplary. And yeah can't get over our community. No, absolutely. Incredible. They had reached out to me early, well earlier, and it, it was, um, it took a little time to figure out a proper way to do this. 
Um, and thanks once again to Mike, Chuddy, and you know everybody that was involved in making it happen. But um, that was a that was a that was a great donation. Thank you, uh, Destiny. He has her hand up. I think Matt still has his hand up from before, but I'm not positive. But Destiny, go ahead. I will go really quick. Uh, just to add on to that, the the Chatham Food Pantry has been doing a amazing job helping the community throughout this pandemic. And Mrs. Matthews, uh, Judy, sorry, uh, has been doing an amazing job connecting people with food. So a thank you to her and a thank you to the Chatham Food Pantry because without them, our community would be nowhere near where it should be. Excellent. I think we all uh, concur on that. Um, no hands up. Uh, we'll move along on to uh, superintendent's reports. Uh, Sal, what do you have for us? Oh, we have a lot of stuff for you tonight. Um, I'm going to... Uh, a real question. <laughs> bear with me. Uh, get, get our technology in order here. Um, so this time, instead of stealing Mike's thunder with my report, um, we're going to start out with it. Uh, here are some of the items we're going to go over tonight in the superintendent's report, but Mike is going to start out with a PowerPoint. So it'll take me a second to reorient at this and Mike. Uh... All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight we'll go through the second part of the budget. Uh, I met, we met with finance committee last week, I uh, went over this. And then the next meeting that we meet, we'll go over the third part, which will be transportation benefits and uh, special education. And, and it'll, we'll get a good first draft of the whole budget with revenues to see where we stand uh, moving forward. So Sal, if you go to the next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna go through a couple slides and then I have, um, Barb is here for, to discuss the cafeteria slide and Giles will discuss the technology uh, slide. And then since we don't, do not have currently a library director, hopefully soon, I will be discussing briefly the library slide. So before I begin to the main thing with the instructional piece, and you'll see this in the uh, second slide, is the increase is only 0.74%. So it's, it's, a, it's a very low increase and, uh, and I'll go through these numbers, but a lot of it's due to the, uh, five retirements this year on the teaching staff. So the breakage uh, really helped with the budget. Uh, to balance for this year. So if we look at this slide on the uh, beginning, curriculum development and supervision, that increased at $36,000. And, and pretty much with all of these slides, it's really uh, gonna be increases in salaries. We kept supplies and conferences and equipment, everything else right now we were able to hold even um, based on what the governor's you know, budget was, uh, the executive budget. But in this line, you have the curriculum development, which is um, our administrator of educational service position and secretary and supplies, and then supervision includes the principals and assistant principals, their secretaries, supplies, conferences, equipment. So this increase, as I stated, is just uh, salaries uh, in this line. And the next line, research planning, evaluation, and service training, you can actually see a decrease of almost 40,000. Um, this actually, this line also would be almost a flat line. It's really, we're really not cutting 40,000 out. You'll see on the next slide in a Giles technology budget line, we're actually increasing. BOCI shifted their costs for our model school software. So that's our IXL or iReady curriculum um, assessments. Um, all of that software was shifted from this code to, that, to the technology code. So you'll see an increase there. And this was just um, BOCI's recoding uh, where they wanna place that. So this line, uh, research planning and service, uh, we have the data analysts through BOCES that we get two and a half days. Um, summer curriculum development is in this line. Our uh, school improvement through BOCES, our professional development days through BOCES, my learning plan, super eval. And remember in the summer curriculum, one of the positives is we get to run that through BOCES. So uh, we budget 40,000, but we get half of that back as we run, we build that through BOCES for our teachers in the summer to do their curriculum. Teaching is really, the next line is really the line that usually you don't see this. It's basically flat or $770 uh, dollar decrease. So this is our pre-K to 12 teachers. This is all the supplies, uh, conferences. It includes the um, Shakespeare robotics that we put in the budget years ago, the textbooks. It has all the, um, uh, let's see what else here. 
conferences, supplies, teaching assistance, the aides. Um, so the main reason here is, as I stated, we had the teacher retirements. We had quite a few teachers, five teachers this year, uh, four put in notice, and we had one from that put in notice a couple of years ago. Uh, so that's what's keeping this line, you know, relatively flat. Usually you don't see that. Next line, special education. I highlight that in yellow because I did not. The only thing I did with this line is I adjusted everyone in their programs this year. So we did have some changes. We actually had a high cost student move into BOCES, um, but we had some contingent money to offset that. So this is a line that I'll meet with Brian Simon. Actually, we're gonna meet Friday. And then right before the board meeting, we'll, we'll, we'll check over the numbers again, because as you know, one student moves in or out can be you know, a significant dollar amount. So this number, like, as I stated, is just a rollover of what we have this year, but I have to sit down with him and go in depth with that on Friday. And then before we meet again with the board. The next line, actually, it is a decrease of 30, almost you know, a little over 32,000 occupational education, summer school and adult ed. What's driving this increase is our occupational ed or through BOCES, that CTE program. And that's our five-year average. Uh, they base it on a five-year average for our students. And we dropped from 40.2 to 37.8. So that is accounting for all the $32,000 decrease. There are some years when the five-year average goes up, we hit, it flips the other way and we're going up 20 or 30,000. But this year, um, we have the benefit of that, helping the budget. Summer school, just a summer school program, we kept flat. And then adult education is driver's ed and adult ed. Uh, that budget actually gets offset with revenues. That pretty much balances out. So like this year, we're not running the programs as much, but we're also not receiving the revenue. So those numbers wash out. So this, this is really a flat budget, except the uh, CTE program dropped 32000 then library and AV, uh, this is our librarians, the two we have, and then all the databases. And, uh, and we have a set amount of money and I'll be meeting with the librarians to go over their databases. Usually they look at, a uh, nice thing is they really go through the numbers on what's being utilized and what's not. So that a lot of times we just shift things based on usage and, and, and uh, teacher preference and some of the ideas that they want. So this line is just going up on salaries, a little over $6,000. Everything else is held flat. Uh, next slide, Sal. I'll have Giles go through the technology budget. Um, as I stated, remember that $39,000 decrease on the previous slide? All of that money for the model school software was reallocated uh, to this line through BOCES. And you can see a, a slight increase. We did purchase a couple other software items due to the uh, online learning that uh, Lisa and I will be reviewing for next year. But that 53,000 is just same thing, salaries, and then that it's really shifting over all those costs from the other line. So that would even out. The guidance, health, psychology, social worker, same thing, supplies, conferences, all of those numbers were held flat. Remember we had the guidance position we eliminated and we hired a new psychologist. So that those are shown in these numbers uh, that was done last year. You know, you have the health, we have three nurses, and then we have our doctor and all the contractual costs with that. Um, and psychologists and social workers. So this line, same thing, it's just an increase in, in salaries. And then the last line, co-curricular athletics. I met with JB, um, the supplies, the chaperones, all the coaches, all the referees, all of these costs we kept, we, we were able to keep flat for another year. Um, we are looking at one bit of software through Huddle, uh, you know, one of the nice things we had was we were able to show these games. Um, everyone can watch the basketball games online and people from far away can watch them. So we're actually looking to, and uh, we use our Huddle account through BOCES where we get the aid. And that software allows all the coaches, they get all their statistics and they can key up on players and, and run all that software through that. But we're looking to add some cameras in the school, possibly outside, but I'm not sure, you know, we'll have to see if we can get uh, Wi-Fi there or not. But definitely we're looking at the school. I'm getting a quote on that. And that way we won't have someone with an iPad running the games. It'll be fixed. It'll, it'll actually move on the player's movement and it has the score on there. So you can see the score the whole time. It's really uh, excellent software. Um, we're looking at doing that because I think, you know, we saw the benefit of people, that, you know, when they can come back to the games with people that are far away or can't make a game, they can tune in. I had for my son play JV basketball this year. Uh, his uh, grandparents in Brazil watch the game and, you know, the relatives out there and I have parents in Western New York. So you have parents and grandparents that can, you know, that aren't living in the area that could watch this. So we are looking to do that. Um, so the final, the instructional pieces, I stated 113,000 and a big piece of that was due to those five retirements. So we got the breakage on that. So it's only a 0.74% uh, increase, a very, very slight increase. 
which I will show on a later slide um, after Barb and Giles go, uh, where we stand, you know, with a run through the whole budget at this point in time. So before I go to Barb and Giles uh, for those two pieces, technology and cafeteria, do we have any questions on these these two slides? Okay, so uh, let's see who's next. Giles, or Sal, can you see who's up first? All right, so I'll have Giles Felton, our uh, technology director. He'll he'll discuss a little bit about the technology program. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, we kept our budget pretty much the same. As you said, the big increase was the um, BOCES change. But the interesting thing to point that out, that's all instructional software. That's all software that's used for a student use. Um, we're running it through BOCES, so that 50000 that we spend in that code could have cost the district 100000 approximately. Rough numbers, please. Um, but this is all money we've been able to save the district by running software through BOCES and COSERs and cooperative agreements through them. Um, districts are actually just finally realizing they can do this because BOCES and NERC are now putting out lists to see who's compliant with 2D ed law. Um, and districts are finally realizing, but we've realized a long time ago, um, we could offer a lot more software packages to our staff and our students by running software, just billing through BOCES. So it's a nice service that we've worked, you know, in the past five years to really push a lot of our instructional software over there. Um, this year, the real big change, um, obviously COVID, you know, we kind of noticed that in technology, um, but we got a new staff member. We changed out uh, aid to an engineer. Um, the higher skill set has definitely paid off. Um, the individual also, Harris, has been incredibly energetic. He's brought his two children to the district. So he's a parent, he's a, co a worker um, and a resident, obviously. Um, and it's been a really great addition. Um, you know, in time, it might cost the district a little bit more aid versus engineer, but I think this is gonna really pay off in the service we can deliver to our staff. Um, other than that, our technology pretty much stayed pat. We had, you know, years ago, a good rise in our hardware budget, but this year we needed it because we actually increased three grade levels of Chromebook use. Um, we went K to first and second grade that weren't using Chromebooks. Um, in April, we decided we needed to give them Chromebooks so they could be connected for education. Um, <clears throat> so we were able to absorb three extra grades because we had excess numbers. And now I'm finally happy to say we've got stock in hand because our orders from July finally came in. So supply chain's been fun this year, um, but we've been able to deal with most things. Um, we now have cameras in hand, we have Chromebooks in hand, we're in good shape, and we'll see what the future brings. So other than that, technology kind of stood pat. Um, you know, we're changing things. We talked about um, the change in firewall. That was a large cost change, but we're able to absorb it within our costs of our department because um, A, we're running it through BOCES that are great savings and B, um, we got to reduce other things, uh, web filter and firewall that we're currently paying for. Um, on a positive note, we haven't had a single DOS attack since we've en enacted Zscaler. So we haven't had to close the district because of technology problems, which has been very nice. Um, we have plenty of other problems, you know. Um, so yeah, it's been nice. Um, we kind of get into the groove of having uh, 1,100 clients, not just, uh, you know, 250 clients. We used to just deal with full-time staff. Now we have every student, literally every student except for pre-K, um, contacting us for tech support and parents um, working through home problems. And I think this year has been good because um, we've dealt with a lot of problems, not just within our own technology, but also at homes, convincing parents to get better connections, convincing them to get better technologies within their own homes, which, you know, where we go back in person or we stay remote or whatever happens in the next, you know, 12 months, um, we'll be stronger for it. Um, so it's about a quick wrap up of the technology budget. Thank you. And any questions? Should always ask that, sorry. Great. Matt, Matt does have a stand up if uh, um, yeah, it's a new hand. <laughs> yep. Um, so I, I just want to dig in a little bit on fleet disposition and management. Um, obviously, the, the fleet's gotten larger and the tech support has gotten larger. Um, so the two questions I have are what is the oldest um, machine we're going to have in our live fleet, you know, the, the student Chromebook fleet? Um, either now or by the end of the year or but by the beginning of next year and then the the second question um is uh 
in terms of the operational change and the support overhead changed, um, are there changes to, um, I guess, service requests or the service desk process flow that um, are impacting uh, the budget and operations here? Um, so just maybe two minutes on that. Um, in terms of fleet, um, because we actually kept spares, we self-insured, our fleet didn't grow too much. Um, our usage grew. Um, we had always, we basically had a loss of, you know, all our spares. Um, the way the high school worked is we had one for every student, but we also had a hundred lying around as spares for different reasons. Same with the other buildings. So our fleet didn't grow too much. Um, it's still, you know, our fleet's larger than the, our um, number of students because now we've got an influx of uh, new Chromebooks, but we always try and keep a padding of that. So we're always available to swap out. So I think, you know, in terms of licensing, we have 1600 Chromebooks licensed, but there's about 1350 out in circulation. Um, the oldest Chromebook, I couldn't tell you, I mean, the oldest Chromebook, I have one, the original one we bought, it still works and I use it at home. Um, the oldest Chromebook could be as old as seven years old, but as long as it works, kids don't return it or a student doesn't return it, um, it's out in production. So we didn't really start buying in volume until about five years ago, um, the Spin R11s. So when we see the asset tags in the 5000s and the 6000s, we try to replace them with newer models. But unless the kid breaks it, um, sits on it, drops it, cat grabs it, um, it's out there in circulation. So the way they're designed is almost like a cell phone. As long as you can connect to this Wi-Fi and you can run the software, it will continue to work. So. So I, um, just to clarify there on that, maybe age was the wrong way to ask that question. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got five kids in district across a bunch of ages and a bunch of classrooms, and I've seen them work last year. And this year, so a lot of diversity. And um, some of the machines are newer and some of the machines are older. Some of the classes are using hungry software and some of them aren't. I have seen at times these machines crawl to the point with no tabs open, no apps open um, because of some classroom software. It, it's basically an un, un, unusable educational experience. And I, I think that those, those are not widespread um, but I suspect some of the newer fleet uh, um, that we have, you know, are not having those same constraints. So I'm, I'm really curious in terms of distribution of resourcing there, if these older machines are going to be kicking around for a while, um, how that's an impact in the classrooms. And I, I know that our, our teachers don't, don't chime up because they've got a lot of uh, big problems to solve, right? Um, but I, I've seen it. it. It really impacts the kids when they, they sit there for 20 minutes, they can't load a video or, or um, you know, they're on a video call and they're, uh, the video call itself brings their machine to a, a standstill. So uh, that's really what I was trying to understand. Um, a lot of times we see that it's actually cookie based um, or the kid hasn't restarted the Chromebook in, you know, six months. Um, we haven't seen too much resource incentive. I mean, the processor is much weaker than a desktop, but the RAM is similar to an average desktop. Um, but the simple thing is when a kid has a problem and he says, my thing froze, we replace the Chromebook and then we look at the Chromebook. So we've been able to cycle through new machines on a pretty regular basis. Um, it's really just, you know, the fleet management is as problems in, occur. So if a problem occurred and a student, for whatever reason, had a meet that didn't load or a video that didn't load, chances are we'd replace the Chromebook as the first step of uh, triage. So we're trying to take out the older Chromebooks. Um, probably the roundabout way of saying that is when an older Chromebook has problems and a problem is alerted to us, we'll replace the Chromebook. So that's how we're trying to manage and triage you know, the, you know, the older machines that might cause problems. Okay. Well, it, it sounds like then maybe the, the examples I've seen are not, maybe not widely uh, affecting people the way I think they might be. Um, you know, if you're not having to intervene and, and swap out a whole classroom's hardware, then that would, that would indicate that maybe they're, maybe they're sized appropriately. But I'm, I've seen some, some examples where that's not the case, and I'm not sure that we're collecting the data. Um, you know, th these have really changed from being supplementary resources to being required resources and the whole pattern's changing. They're running more software at the same time. Um, so, I mean, I, I know that this isn't an easy problem to understand. Um, 
No, I understand the problem, but we don't really have the resources to grapple with it. I mean, I don't have the staff to really worry about utilization of uh, CPU and RAM stats. I'm really just trying to keep the kids having a working device in their hand. Um, with three staff members, that's really where we're at. Um, we've replaced them as needed, but we can't sit there and look at our software and see which ones are running really high in CPU and RAM because we just don't have the resources to do such a task. So I understand your point. It would be good to look at the hardware and see if any of them were really crashing with Seesaw versus you know this app versus that app. Um, certain models we've definitely noticed having problems with meets. Um, but it's also Google when they change operating systems. We've seen problems with that too. So yeah, I, I, there's a I, mixture I, of the hardware, the OS, and the uh, app that the classroom teacher has chosen. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna, not thinking that this is a, a geeky tech problem. I'm thinking I'm gonna that, step in <laughs> yeah. before you say too much, Matt. Uh, uh, you lost half the board on this uh, conversation, Giles. Thank you. <laughs> You're doing a great job. And uh, but what's uh, the second part of the question? Actually, we I forgot. Matt uh, had so, two parts. Yeah, I, th that wasn't intended to be a technical oh, um, I <laughs> question. I, it's really I'm wondering what feedback we're getting from students and and teachers um, about the utility factor here. Um, and I, cause you know, I, I, I see what I see at home when I see kids on a, on a Chromebook, but that's a sample set of five, you know, it's very mm -hmm. small. The um, big feedback we get is um, they all want the ones with the stylus. Uh, Lenovo built their model with a stylus as a foot. Um, and that's in demand. I can tell you that. But other than that, um, yeah, I haven't had too much you know, feedback from the teachers about what's useful and what's not. Um, they love the touch screen. That's all I really heard. Okay. Yeah. And th the second thing was in terms of fulfilling service requests, which is sort of just related to the experience in general. And I, I know that the, the few instances I've heard of problems with the Chromebooks, they've gotten swapped out fast. Um, but it, it seems like your, your order volume, so to speak, or your work order volume must be really high. And I'm curious how that's changed and what, what's happening with the process here. Um, because I'm imagining that this this was an emergency response to needing to to remote work, but there's no re rewinding or unwinding this change, right? We're going to be going forward, and people are going to be using these machines more. Yeah, we didn't really. I mean, I didn't bring stats today, and I could have, and I sometimes do with the help desk. But basically, in March we went into emergency mode, and it hasn't shifted since we haven't come back out of emergency mode. Um, but that's going to be a continual thing based on the volume of emails. Um, I always say emails, but basically calls, service calls, period. More kids, more teachers use the devices, more will get more breakage and more service calls, more support calls for software and hardware. Um, it's just life. Um, how we react to it, we haven't really dealt with it other than we just worked harder. So, yeah, I mean, that could be a discussion we need to have in the future, but I don't think it was a good budget year to ask for more staff or anything like that. Thank you, Giles. <laughs> no problem. All right, Mike. Yeah, uh, Sal. All right, now I'll have Barb Murray. Uh, she'll talk about the cafeteria program. Um, I'll let her, Barb, you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, got a couple slides here. All right, hi everyone, how you doing? Good, how you doing, Barb? Good. Yeah. All right, so we'll start with the first one there, our COVID impact. Um, we've been impacted in many ways. It has affected the um, food avail availability and our food cost. Um, because of how we're serving meals this year, the amount that we are spending on paper products and safety products such as gloves, bleach, cleaning products um, have increased. Our revenue is less due to not having vending sales, no head start, less adults are purchasing, and less students in the building to serve. It has also limited the choices that students can choose from at MED and the middle school, we're not offering deli sandwiches or the yogurt parfaits that we used to or the salads. Um, and at the middle school, they would also have a second choice to a hot entree. And we just don't have the ability to do that this year with how we're serving. Um, so these are, you know, all the items that the students love that we had to take away. Um, and of course, all of that has affected how our budget is um, going to end up for this year. Uh, the second one for the additional financial loss um, luckily, after Mike and I sat down, this is better than we thought it was going to be. 
Um, we thought that we were looking at an additional uh, cost of 137000 that would be transferred at the end of the year on top of our estimated 115000 um, for a total of 252000 As it stands right now, we're looking at the estimated additional cost to only be 83000 on top of the 115, so about 198,000, which is close to 50,000 less, less um, than we expected. Um, and then the, our budget is going to be based on our us coming back in a normal school year next year, hopefully. <laughs> um, and then for the Department of Defense, Defense uh, Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, this is something I've never done before, um, but this year we had some extra money in our USDA commodities because items were canceled due to production issues. So we were able to take some of those funds and divert it to the Department of Defense a program. And that allowed us to bring in um, fresh fruits and vegetables, for example, to buy um, organic apples from New York State Farms, strawberries, um, pears and just all of our normal veggies that we would normally buy cucumbers tomatoes lettuce etc um and then these items are higher priced items so by being able to take right now we took five thousand dollars and i think i have another twenty two hundred dollars i can transfer over by being able to do that it's a small amount but it helps and every little bit helps um one of the things that we did this year <laughs> i thought it was cute but let's see if i can get this picture um let me fix my screen here. Okay. I don't know if anybody can see the strawberry picture there, um, but we made a strawberry dessert for Valentine's Day and handed it out to all the kids. Uh, so it's very fr it fresh strawberries with whipped cream and um, chocolate syrup. <laughs> all right, so, that, um, so that's that. And then we had one more slide, right, Mike? Okay, so with this one, I wanted to kind of give you an overview of last February to this February to kind of show you um, what we were serving last year versus this year. Uh, so if you look at the top part of it, February 2020, um, for let's say the elementary school, uh, our enrollment was 427. Um, and then our average daily participation, we would serve an average of 95 breakfast and 201 lunch. Um, and if you compare it to what we did this year, um, with the average of 285 students in the building, that's the difference of enrollment minus um, who is fully remote. We served 139 breakfast mm -hmm. um, with two less days um, and 155 lunch. Um, so it's not, you know, we're, we're much better in our breakfast and lunch isn't uh, too far off. Um, we'll compare um, the middle school, 246, um, and we were served an average of um, 23 breakfast and 99 lunch um, versus this number here. If you look at the enrollment, unfortunately, I did not get how many were remote yet um, when I did this, but we're serving an average of 46. And it, from my understanding, it's about half. For lunch and uh, 14 for breakfast. And then, of course, you see the high school, 325 was the enrollment last year. Um, breakfast was about 50 and 140 for lunch. And this year, with an average um, daily attendance of 95 students, we're serving 11 breakfast and 50 lunch. So, you know, not too bad. We're kind of staying in the, the half range. Um, for the most part. So I think we're kind of on trend to what we expected. All right. I, I think that's all we had. Is there any questions? I just want to thank you, Barb. And, and well, Thomas, Matt, but, uh, Matt, Matt has his hand up. And yeah, I, I, um, first of all, these, these numbers were great to see that, um, we're keeping our participation up, but I, I really wanted to, um, cheer the results or or maybe just an observation of the results in the med breakfast because it looks like and i haven't done the math on this it looks like our participation doubled per capita yes yeah uh, it did and and it it it's in it's an observation that maybe more kids are eating breakfast than they used to be um and i i'm not sure 
maybe that maybe they've shifted their breakfast to in school instead of before school. But um, I, I did go to my kids and said of the, of the elementary kids who who eats breakfast in your class from the school breakfast. And in in one of the examples, the answer was almost everyone, which was interesting. Um, and in another, in another example, they said, oh, just like three or four kids. So it, it does seem to be maybe cultural or class specific, but um, there's an observation there that here um, versus a non-emergency year, we're doing higher participation there. Um, and it would be, you know, it's interesting, um, interesting to just think about that. Um, I did ask them, you know, why, um, how, how is breakfast being served? I understand you made it really easy for them, right? Yes. Yes, we actually serve in the hallways um, and they just come up, they choose which one they want. It's in a bag, they go to their classroom. And I think that's what the difference is. It's easier for them to obtain it. Yeah, and I, I that may not be something we can sustain, frankly, but um, for a bunch of reasons, but um, uh, certainly these participation numbers are, we'd be lucky to keep them up. Yes, I'd like to. I, I've got a question, um, kind of around Barb, but it's probably for Mike. Um, that donation of from the food pantry, what? Where does that go, Mike? Does that go That's into our food? That, that no, that money, that that five thousand. Yeah. That, yeah, that's actually set up. We're going to work with uh, Tracy Kelly, and we're going to work with the three schools. That's actually to help. Uh, it's really not for food. It's for helping the resident, our, you know, our kids. Okay. It, it, it could be for a multiple of things. Not, it's not really food related. So it could be a lot of different items. Um, I understand. Kind of like a fun we used to have where some kids needed some, you know, if they needed something here or there, they would get it. Um, that's really what that's for. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And Sal, Sal had comment too. Thank you. No, I just want to say I tried those strawberry cupcakes and, and, and they were really good. Um, <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I know Mike Chuddy was in line in the hall too. Mike, they're, they're wonderful. I, I actually, I want to thank uh, Barb and Giles for you know for for all the work they've done. Giles, we had you know that obviously the technological issues, and it was amazing amount of work he did this year, um, and to get us going, get through that, it was very difficult. And Barb, same thing with this, really trying to make a cafeteria run on with what's going on. Uh, your whole staff and you did a you know an outstanding job in, in light of the environment. Hopefully, we start getting back to normal. Uh, and we can start moving forward and start planning different meals with the kids and all that, you know, the fun stuff. But this was a tough year, but you really did a lot. You tried to, you tried your best to do any, you know, like those ideas. So I appreciate all the work. No, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Giles. Thank you, Barb, for everything you guys do. Thank you. Now for the library, I went over this, you know, I go through the detailed budget with CPLAC, um, and this is showing the transfer line, $7,500. Uh, the detailed budget, you know, years ago, we kind of showed the library as a standalone, where if we said, you know, we, we allocate our maintenance person, we allocate some tech staff, uh, we allocate the, uh, we have the heating, the electric, the phones, the water and sewer, so all of that. So on this budget, the main thing uh, that really changed was salaries, obviously increases in salaries and benefits. Uh, the ERS rates went up slightly. So that, that's really the $7,500 increase. Otherwise, everything went flat. I actually went through this with Julie before she did leave. Um, and then typically we would have, you know, when we have our new director, they would actually talk about the, the library over the year and all the, you know, with all the programming, what's going on. Um, so we're, we're still in a process of searching and hopefully, you know, soon, like I said, we'll have someone. I've been heading over to the library about twice a week to see if there's any issues and, and help handle some of the problems. And they've been doing a wonderful job, but hopefully we get a director soon. Um, so that's really the library budget, just salary and in, in, uh, increase. And then the last draft. So last time we did this on the first part of the budget, we were about 235,000 in deficit. As you can see on this one, we're 101,000. So that's a good improvement. You know, we're getting close, you know, it's, at this point in time, you know, I'm happy to see that, especially in light of everything what we were thinking a year ago, what we we're going to be dealing with. So we're getting close on this. Um, the expenditures now 1.37%. It's not, you know, not a very hard, large, large increase. And it, a lot of that also did help with the retirements that we had in the staff. Um, and the 1.81 is, I think I went through that last meeting, that is the tax levy, uh, but we will discuss in finance and bring a recommendation to the board if we go to that amount. Sometimes we go slightly less, but we'll see. So right now, $101,000 deficit moving in the right direction. 
We still have health insurance, which is going to be a big piece. Uh, special education, obviously, is going to be another big piece that I have to go through. Um, and then I'll sit with, uh, like I said, transportation uh, this week also. So that'll be the last piece of the budget. And then, you know, if there's any adjustments or anything, any other ideas we're, we're looking to entertain. So that's this. Uh, that's where we stand uh, right now with the with the budget. Any other questions? Thank you. Muriel had her hand up. Yes, I, I wanted to ask um, before Barbara. Do we still have the backpack program this year? Yes, there is still the back backpack program. Um, we are not involved in it, but there are people in the district who do that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Muriel. I'll um. um Let's see, I know we have some, some of the assistant principals on the call, but rather than do that to them, I'll, I will gather some information as I've done uh, in past years. I don't think I've updated the board in a while. I'll mm -hmm. reach out to those who coordinate that in all three buildings. And um, hopefully by the Friday report, I can give you a little update on the backpack pro that, backpack oh. room and perhaps how it may look a little different this year. But I know, I'm pretty sure Ann O'Neill, um, uh, I think it's changed here at MED, um, and um, who what runs it at the high schools escaped me, but I'll, I'll get you an update on that. Thank you. Sal, Sal I believe it's Christina Scott at, okay. um, at MED and uh, Carol Williams at the high it's school. But, programs. Okay, I knew she- Yeah, but uh, verify that. Yeah. But I think okay. that's what it is. I know um, when I, I go into the faculty room here, the tables are still full of uh, deliveries and stuff like that. So I know something's happening, but we'll get you an update on that. Thank you. Um, Mary, you're, you still have your hand up unless Denise has questions. Wow. Let me see here. Is, <laughs> low, just, is it down? It's down. Now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great report. Good questions, guys. Thanks. Okay. So that's only the tip of the iceberg. Oh, yes. So let's get you updated on a few other things. So um, just to keep me organized, uh, I'll bring up some other artifacts as we're going along. So that takes care of the budget for Mr. Uh, Chuddy. So thank you very much. Uh, the next um, order of business, my next presentation, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, bring up some notes here for myself. Oh, sorry about that. It's the one thing about trying to do this Zoom on the same screen you're trying to work on. So, um, as I reported in the final report, uh, in September, the governor signed into law a requirement that all public employers, including school districts, adopt a continuation of operations plan. Um, if the, if, should the governor declare a public health emergency involving uh, communicable diseases, um, this amends education law um, so that we can add this to our district-wide safety plans, which we typically share with the board um, in the spring and have, have an obligation to post to our website for public comment and then you adopt it end of June or I believe early July. So we'll do that. Uh, this plan identifies various aspects of providing a safe work environment and uh, continued education of students and district operations during an emergency. And uh, it outlines the essential roles and critical functions uh, within the plan to assist us in delivering required assets and support to the instructional and non-instructional areas to effectively continue our operations. Uh, this particular, the plan that I um, uh, have shared with you uh, as a draft um, was uh, the template for which uh, was provided to us by uh, Quest R3. Uh, we then worked with our health and safety specialists, Patrick Perator, Mr. Chuddy, um, Andy Davey, uh, and I to, to kind of uh, customize it to meet the needs of Chatham. We then, as part of the um, requirement, shared it with all the collective bargaining associations for feedback. Um, I wanna thank those um, who have given us feedback and we're down to just a couple items. Um, oh, there's, okay, down to a couple items uh, that we're still addressing uh, with Chris Chanton, our, our school attorney uh, that the, um, the, the teachers union had brought to our attention. And uh, so we're, we're working through those. So in time, they're, they're somewhat minor changes um, and I would bring those to you prior to asking you to approve these, or to approve the plan uh, at the next meeting um, on the 23rd of March. Once the board has, um, it's not a requirement that the board um, approve the plan, but I always think it's a good idea if we're gonna have a continuity of operations plan that the board 
um, feels that it's acceptable and, and is and is um, satisfied with it. So I would like you to give me your okay on that um, by the next meeting or on the, at the next meeting. And then uh, subsequently, uh, we will post it to the website so it's publicly available. Uh, there's nothing in the plan in terms of, um, unlike our, our individual building safety plans that could give someone um, any specific information that could be um, used in terms of a security vulnerability. So um, that's the plan. I, I, I don't know if any anybody has. Um, I do have, um, you know, a, I can bring up a, just a thumbnail of the plan um, for those who have not seen it. It's um, several, it's, you know, a lot of pages. So I don't know if the board had any specific questions um, about the, the plan that I can answer tonight or prior to the next board meeting. Um, and so that would be that portion of the um, report. So if, if there's anything right now that you'd like to ask, we can do that or we can certainly handle that between now and the next meeting if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it. It's 39 pages, so. Good so far? I see no hands, Sal. So. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, a quick update on the library director's position. So. Uh, I know I've been keeping you apprised on our Friday updates, but I'm pleased to report that we interviewed our two final candidates yesterday. And uh, the committee, which is made up of Mr. Chuddy, uh, John McGowan, who heads up the um, CPLAC uh, advisory uh, committee and um, one of our library aides, um, um, Corey, am I saying that right? Um, we have made a selection. Um, I have checked uh, the references, the reference letters, and uh, I reached out to that candidate uh, this afternoon. We've been playing um, some text tag, um, and she wanted to call me back this evening, but I um, told her that we had a, a board meeting, so we're uh, looking to, to talk tomorrow morning. I will uh, make her an offer and see if we can negotiate uh, an, an acceptance uh, to, um, to come be our new director. Um, and as I mentioned to you in the Friday report, I think all the candidates would have um, made a fine addition to the library, two of which stood out and um, we uh, have offered, or we will be offering to the, the committee's top choice um, from that, po that point forward. If that works out and she agrees uh, to the terms and conditions um, that we're able to provide her, which are similar to the management confidential, they're the terms and conditions that the board has already previously approved um, for the library director. Uh, and agrees to the salary that we're able to provide uh, her, then I will bring a recommendation to the board on the 23rd. I will also find out uh, when I speak to her, uh, based on that time frame, what type of notice she feels she would need to give her current employer, so that way I could pin down an estimated starting date. Um, and Ted has his hand up. <laughs> Still learning to drive this damn computer. Um, <laughs> Continuity of operations plan. Uh, quickly, this is not the place to detail educational strategies in response to a, a public health problem, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm seriously looking forward to that aspect of plan in the future detailing somewhat what we learned and, and what we, where we may go with it. Uh, now is not the time. I thank you. Okay, Ted. Oh, so just put it up a little bit. Uh, going on to um, our, our COVID response update, a, a section that we've kind of included for quite a few months. I'm pleased to report that, you know, the uh, positivity continues to be very favorable. I just pulled this um, from the Columbia County website. It's the data as of yesterday, it's today's posting. Uh, the county is down to 1.8%. Um, we are, are continuing to see uh, through uh, governor's actions, uh, the ability for restaurants to open up and, and the economy to kind of start to get back on track. Um, we are just finishing up this week with our high, school, high risk sports. Uh, it's hard to believe that you know the board approved that plan back on February 9th and uh, we were able to put our sports teams together and they were able to compete um, on average of a couple times a week, JV about once a week. Um, the, as you recall, 
one of the requirements that was put placed on us by the Columbia County Department of Health was that once we were competing with other teams, we needed to uh, the requirement of testing our athletes and coaches once a week. Um, I really greatly appreciate the efforts of our nurses who've worked as a team to assist our high school nurse Val uh, in having and accomplishing that, and uh, to JV for helping Serena. John Thorson help schedule that. Um, in terms of the Questar region, as of yesterday morning, which doesn't include any of the testing that went on yesterday or today, um, the Questar is reporting that there were 2,663 tests that had been completed and uh, one positive um, that did not uh, occur here. Uh, we had a, um, a positive that was con then later confirmed negative with a PCR. So uh, we didn't report that as a, a, a positive, but there was one positive in the whole region. So pretty good statistics um, in terms of uh, the safety of these high-risk sports. One of the big questions that remained, um, you know, as the season moved, moved, moved on through the three or four weeks, um, there was some question, we've talked about it uh, previously as to whether we would um, lo um, loosen up the restrictions in terms of spectators uh, in consultation with the, with the superintendents in the, um, in the conference uh, and in the county. Things were going well, parents were reviewing online and we really didn't wanna upset the apple cart, so to speak end up having a positive case that would shut the season down. So a decision was made to finish out the season this week with the existing conditions and um, and then look towards fall too, which starts, uh, uh, if weather permitting, starts uh, this, this next week and have a discussion about revisiting spectators. Um, I have a meeting again, like every Wednesday with the Columbia County Department of Health. And that, that's one of our topics for this week as well. I can tell you that, um, the um, director, Jack Mab, is really comfortable in terms of outdoor sports uh, in, in having flexibility to offer spectators. We'll have to see in terms of this season, which also includes girls volleyball, obviously indoors, whether um, we decide to allow spectators or continue with a streaming scenario. So more to come in terms of spectators for the fall too. And then of course, looking ahead um, to, to spring sports, those are not considered high risk. Um, we will not, uh, and I should go back a step. Fall two football is still considered high risk uh, as, as is girls volleyball. So we will still, we're assuming we're still gonna have to test unless um, the director decides that because the positivity rate has now um, diminished to the point where it is um, pretty low that he'll suspend that requirement. But right now we are uh, assuming that we're going to have to test athletes once a week because it is still considered a quote unquote high risk sport. However, when we get to spring and we're doing uh, baseball and softball, those are not classified as high risk. And we don't at this point expect that we're gonna have to test or um, that we would have to restrict spectators. So that's our, that's our hope. Wow. Uh, the, the last piece, and then I'll certainly open it up to questions is um, we continue to try to pass along uh, vaccination information. Um, the, this week, uh, just, just prior to, um, coming or uh, beginning the board meeting, I had, I had gotten an email that there is going to be a vaccination clinic held uh, this Thursday, sponsored by um, the Columbia County Department of Health at the uh, community college as they have to focus on uh, essential workers, which our teachers fall into that category. Uh, I sent that link out and then I saw a text from the county and saying they were having problems with the website. Again, those, those links have been hit or miss. They, they put up a, you know, amount of vaccines and those, those, um, Websites are hit really quick, and sometimes we have good luck with getting some of our staff in, and, and other times we don't. But I am I am happy to report I don't have uh, clear metrics just yet. But um, uh, MED is an example. Um, we took a look today at some of the um, self-reporting that's been done in terms of people who've been vaccinated. And uh, when I looked at the list, uh, I only saw 14 staff members. Now that's NED. I, I don't know if, I don't believe that list included district employees, but of the entire staff, which includes teachers, teaching assistants, uh, aides, uh, I, there were only 14 names of individuals who are either not vaccinated or have chosen not to be vaccinated. So, you know, we're getting up um, uh, without having the actual numbers, uh, at least in this building, we're up to like 80%. Um, uh, vaccinated if, if my rough my rough calculations are correct. So our mission to try to get as many 
uh, staff persons vaccinated so we can not only kind of reduce the anxiety, but as you've seen from the, uh, the reports that once you've been vaccinated and what they call fully vaccinated, which is 14 days out from your second vaccination, if it's uh, one of the vaccinations that requires two doses or 14 days out from uh, the new Johnson & Johnson, uh, I would assume would apply. Then um, some of the um, parameters around having to quarantine, having to test, it all changes. So there is there is some glimmer of hope and light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna pause for a second on the COVID response to answer any questions and then go on to the final two things that I have for you. So there's a couple hands. I think Ted forgot to put his hand down, but Chris Spencer has his hand up. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. And then after Chris, I, I have some other good news I forgot to tell you about. Uh, well, I was just curious. So that 80% is uh, in the middle school, you said? Yeah, I don't. Uh, I just happened to um, uh, buzz Roughly. across the hall to, uh, this is MED, and the nurse was sharing some of her own data with me um, late this afternoon. So um, we, you know, we, we have a voluntary link out there where staff, if they would like to report to us if they've been vaccinated or not. As you remember, the governor had put a requirement in place through an executive order. And then a few days later, based on um, different factors, he, he backed off on that. So it's no longer a requirement that staff notify us they, they've been vaccinated. So they, they chose to try to figure this out through the local departments of health, which quite honestly, I'm not really sure uh, how practical that is because for those of us who've gone for a vaccine, um, they know what category we're in, but they don't know whether we're a teacher or a superintendent. So if what he was trying to gain was an, uh, a ratio of teachers to students within a building, I don't, I don't know if that's gonna materialize like they expected. Um, so that, that's just the commentary. The, um, the other thing, and I know the board has been copied on this, um, and I should have said, I should have mentioned this because I'm so excited about it. Um, we have, um, we have a staff person uh, within the school district whose spouse actually uh, works for Walgreens. And um, we had been hearing over the last couple of days that uh, through a superintendent in Lansingburg that some of the Walgreens were reaching out to their school districts. Um, I, I received a uh, communication today and I've been working with one of the regional managers to potentially set up. We don't have all the details uh, finalized right now. They have a number a very large number of Johnson and Johnson vaccines that they need to use um, within the very near future, um, and have offered us to potentially create a um, a, a a custom pod right here within the district. So we are we are feverishly working on trying to get something for either Friday evening after work or Saturday, uh, potentially both. Some depends on their the availability of their pharmacists and scheduling. But what's so exciting about that for me is Johnson's and John J and J is one shot, and if we can get it on a Friday or Saturday, it gives us that buffer for those who are receiving it to, if they're not feeling well the next day, they can recover. Because as you know, in our on our effort to really try to get as many staff persons vaccinated, it's been a bit disruptive, especially when there's a large number of uh, staff people who go at the same time. And as you know, I've reported to you um, that happened to us and as a result, and we've notified parents giving them as much advance notice as possible that on March 26th, we have to go fully remote one more time here at MED to accommodate all those staff persons that are getting the second vaccine. And just a little qualifying comment for you, Chris, when I said vaccinated, that means that they've either gotten both their first or second, or they've gotten their first and their second is scheduled. So I want so um, after, within the next few weeks, um, the rest of the, the staff who have that second dose scheduled will then fall into that category. So um, anything, anyone else in terms of vaccinations? Got everybody? Okay, a couple, uh, couple more things uh, that I know you're probably interested in. Um, I think it was just this week, uh, we got notification, is this yesterday? Yes, yesterday that um, there's been a final determination uh, in terms of how we uh, determine what, how, what number of petitions or, or signatures that a, a person running for the board member would, uh, would need. Uh, if you remember, because of the large turnout last year uh, in terms of um, absentee uh, voting, uh, some people had brought to the attention of, um, of the governor that um, 
we typically use 2% of the previous year's voter turnout. And that last year, if we use the voter turnout, um, the, the numbers would been, have been in some ways artificially large um, and perhaps unfair. So they did make a determination this week that we would use the, 2000, the May 2019 um, numbers. And in Chatham, we had 492 votes. So 2% of that is 9.8 signatures, but there is a minimum of 25 signatures. So for this upcoming Board of Education election, um, those who are interested in running uh, will need to pick up petitions. They will be, be available beginning March 19th, which is a week from Friday. And um, people who are seeking election will have to receive 25 signatures. There's a couple other things that are, that are not resolved yet. Um, one is whether someone can use COVID um, as a justification to request a absentee ballot. We're still waiting for determination on that. Um, and we're waiting for final confirmation that our local board of election is gonna provide us the electronic voting machines. If you recall last year, um, that was problematic because of primary elections that were going on and, and voting machines that had to either be sequestered or um, uh, secured. And we ended up having to manually count all of the um, paper, paper ballots. Uh, and again, that went really smooth under um, Debbie's leadership. And we had several community members who were in on that. And, um, but it did take several hours to complete. This year, we're very hopeful that we're gonna have access to um, an electronic machine um, whereby which we still will have an, a very safe uh, and secure in-person option. Um, and then based on whatever determination is made, um, there's always the availability of absentee ballots. We just have to find out whether, again, if someone wants an absentee ballot for some reason related to COVID that they can have it that way. So that's, I don't know if any, uh, that's um, what I know about this year's um, petitions and, and board elections. Uh, the only other thing that I'll mention is that um, if you recall uh, last year, the board passed a resolution to reduce the number of board members from nine to seven. And uh, we, that, that it has to occur in one, uh, has to occur in one year. And so this year, instead of um, the traditional three members that we would reelect, there is only one full-time seat available for election. And because we had a couple of resignations along the way, there is one one year seat that's still available. So um, I, I next meeting, if you'd like Craig, I can bring up a chart and show everybody because it, it is confusing and we've gone over it several times, but in short, we've had two resignations within the last year or so that's, and we're, we're very pleased that we have two wonderful board members who've joined us. Um, one seat was scheduled to expire for this election. So we would not be renewing that seat. And one of the um, resignations was scheduled to um, expire next year. So the way we look at this, um, we will have two seats available, uh, one for a three-year term, one for a one-year term. And the way that works is the person who receives the most votes would get the longer term and the person receiving um, the less, the second person uh, in order, depending on how many candidates run, would, would receive the one year seat. So that's that is correct. So that's what I know for now. Um, yep. And if there are no questions here, I'm going to go on to one last thing because I know this was a long report um, and we've got some other things to do. But I wanted to give you a first glimpse um, at the draft calendar for next year, um, just giving you an, uh, an opportunity to kind of resize my screen and resize the sharing. Um, so each year, uh, we, about this time, we take a look at how the days um, and uh, uh, end up. And um, I'll just make a couple, you know, there's not anything earth shattering, just a couple notations about this draft that um, if there are not any um, objections to uh, we would ask the board to adopt at the next meeting. So if you look at it, um, what are some things that you might want to make note of? Uh, the first probably um, difference from last year to this year is because of our response to COVID, we moved all four uh, conference days, superintendent's conference days to the first week of school. 
that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday after Labor Day were all professional development days in next year's calendar. Although there's a, still a lot of unknowns about what next year's school year will look like um, in terms of uh, our students and, and our buildings and facilities. Uh, we do not see the need for uh, uh, front ending our professional um, uh, conference days. So this proposal seeks to start school as we have in the past on the uh, traditionally on the Tuesday after Labor Day, the, the Tuesday the 7th and Wednesday the 8th would be staff only days with students returning to our buildings and hopefully in a traditional manner on September 9th. Um, we then again have put another conference day on election day that has served us pretty well in the past. There's two reasons why we've selected that again this year. First is that that allows us to not have students um, within the building. And since this is used as a uh, local polling site, we feel that that's an added um, school safety security measure. Uh, but the second is that that was the date that also all the um, schools and Questar 3 have agreed on as a regional professional development day. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we will uh, participate. We've you know, we, we really wait and evaluate that based on the professional development committee as to whether we see value in what's being offered regionally. And there have been times where we've been all in and, and um, had our uh, staff attend events that are uh, sponsored by Questar. And then there are times where we've, we've had certain uh, aspects or certain uh, groups, um, special area groups and attend some of the offerings while others stay back here. So that's the November, um, second date, and then the last uh, professional development date is um, right now is scheduled for April 14th. There are a couple half day professional development release dates. You see those in blue ovals. And then you'll see most of the other dates in red are traditional holidays. The one date that it will be new to next year's calendar, that's probably worth just a little bit of a notation, um, is our new holiday, Juneteenth. Now, um, Juneteenth is being celebrated this year. Um, however, it is a Saturday and um, the way the legislation is written, it is optional whether you celebrate it on Friday. Um, and because our school calendar was already in place and it's very critical that we get the required number of session days in, in terms of um, state aid, um, we don't necessarily have the ability to make that a holiday uh, in this current year calendar. However, next year it falls on a Sunday. And when it falls on the Sunday, um, uh, the legislation is that you celebrate it on a Monday. And um, you'll see that not only have we placed it in the calendar as a holiday, but the state has recognized that and has not made that um, a, in turn a regent's um, day. So the regents in June of 22, assuming that we're back on track for regents, which I have no reason to expect that we won't be, will take place the 15th, 16th, 17th. 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, and for the first time ever, we'll be celebrating Juneteenth Day. Um, pretty much everything else is as you would expect, Good Friday um, and the following week, um, and all the other standard holidays. So I see you got some hands up. So, oh, um, that was first. Yep, yeah, before you do that, because I, so this year, and it fluctuates depending on when uh, school starts in September and how late in, in June the school year ends, it, it then varies how many snow days that we can build into the system. This particular calendar has four days. And as I've reported to the board, uh, we did a little bit of an analysis over the last six years, we use an average of 3.2 days. And when we looked at the distribution of how many days in any given year, um, there was only two occurrences in those six that we exceeded uh, the four. Now, I know maybe one, not to anticipate all your questions, but one question is the state education department had this year had a pilot where schools um, who, you know, we've learned a lot about teaching remotely and remote learning, and we've counted on students being at home. So some schools participated in a pilot where on inclement weather days, rather than calling a traditional snow day where there was no instruction taking place, taking place, they switched to a full remote day. They're gonna be reporting out to um, the state education department. The state education department is gonna make a decision as to whether going forward, that would be a viable option for us. Um, we decided because of the, I'll, I'll call it trauma that, that um, and anxiety that COVID's brought on that the few days that we've had this year, and there's now been three snow days that we've called, um, we let those be snow days 
um, where students could just go out and enjoy the uh, winter weather. Um, the last um, notation is of our three snow days this year, and I believe we had, um, I don't have my last year calendar or this year calendar in front of me, but I think we had five built in. Um, of those three, two occurred during a state of emergency. And um, about a year ago, new legislation came about that if the governor um, or the, the, the local governmental agency calls a state of emergency, um, and Columbia County was added um, later in the process, um, those two days that the storm kind of hit New York City and um, south of here to a greater extent than it did here, we were still closed for two days, those do not count against us. So it's really not gonna, it looks like the weather's getting nicer and, and you know, we never know in the Northeast, but um, because we had five built in and we've used three, one or three, depending on how you look at it, um, it's unlikely that um, that's gonna be of any benefit to us, but should we have a really bad blizzard come next week and we need to close for some days, uh, we really technically have four more built into, uh, into the calendar. And just remember as a final comment, that contractually, um, if we don't use all of our snow days, so if we have a minimum of one left, then we need to give um, two of the, uh, uh, well, effectively by giving the two bargaining units that have that off, uh, we couldn't open, open school. So the Friday prior to Memorial Day weekend would be a non-instructional day um, that we would have to notify parents that we would not be open. So with that, uh, I don't, Greg, I don't know who went first, Beth or Matt. Thank you, uh, Sal. Uh, Sal. Uh, Matt had his hand up first. Uh, partially answered um, regarding the state having not made up their mind yet on uh, session days versus attendance. Um, but snow was not the only cause of our emergency closures. We went remote because of power. We went remote because of DOS attacks. We went remote for other reasons. Um, so if we're not in an emergency declaration, where does that leave you in terms of your uh, authority to make a decision inside the district? I know, um, I, I believe pre-clearance from the governor, we closed in advance and decided to go remote, right? And they sort of cleared you later on that at the beginning you of last year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you, you saw about my comments on the Friday report. We, you know, we, we knew we were good for, for at least two days. Um, and it just so, it just so happened that, you know, when the governor closed us on, March 17th or 18th there, it all worked out. Um, there's a couple of things that I'll, that, that, again, not going too far down the rabbit hole. You know, if you don't reach your session days in any given year, um, you also, there's a waiver process. Um, the state aid planning office at Questar had suggested that all districts, at least all the Questar districts, um, <laughs> apply for a waiver in advance. And so we have a waiver in the system. Um, I don't think we're gonna need it. So to your point, um, I, every time that, um, we close, so there's closing the, the building, um, but there's but if there's still instruction going on, um, I have a report that I have to file with the State Education Department, and I work through the, the DS Gladys to ensure that um, we're reporting it as a, a emergency closing day in terms of the building, but we, we fully report um, that instruction is still taking place um, remotely. And this year we have that latitude under COVID and, um, and think, you know, I'm shouting a shout out to the teachers because on that morning that I, I think it was a Monday morning that I closed the, I actually closed the district down where we lost power to the high school with, with very, very short notice, um, you know, seconds and minutes, we switched to uh, remote learning um, to kind of preserve the day. And I know I caught them a little off guard, but um, we didn't end up using an emergency closing day for our power outage. We ended up going fully remote and reporting as such to the state. So I, um, I fully expect um, to be able to meet our 176 um, student attendance days and four conference days for the minimum of 180. That's the magic number. And I also fully expect based on the regulation to hit the, um, the uh, instructional minutes um, at both the elementary, middle and high school um, like we need to. I think one of the things I'm curious about is as we leave emergency, um, are you still going to have that option to waive uh, physical, to, to stay in attendance um, with a waiver? 
without an without a state emergency. Right. You know. So that's that's the that's the hundred thousand dollar question. You don't know yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> because it, you know, and I'll uh, you know you know I love to speculate. It, it's it's hard to to say that you can justify remote learning and that you want parent and your and you want districts to offer remote learning, but then when it comes to giving districts the latitude to use that as a credit, I don't, I, I think it's a double standard. I think I, I don't really know if they have a choice. Um, of course, I don't sit in Albany, but it would seem to me that if we can demonstrate that we are de delivering, uh, you know, instruction remotely on a, on a given day, then we should have discretion over whether we are fully remote, whether we use a snow day or go fully remote. And as I sit here right now, um, I don't necessarily know whether we want to turn every snow day into a virtual learning day. I think there's a, maybe, maybe we use a combination, right? Maybe it gives us some flexibility in the schedule like it does for next year that if, you know, if we hit the four snow days, we don't have to go into the April break because we know that we can use any day after four, we can go over to remote learning. So it gives us a lot of flexibility, but Matt, at this, at this point, it's yet uh, one of a growing list of questions that, we as superintendents have that we really would like answered um, as we go into planning for next year. Um, and, you know, not to, to get off my soapbox, the other one is um, required distancing. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I know it's, there, those are discussions that are occurring at the state education department and government level, but um, there, that, that, has, that is yet to be resolved. Rating. All right. Beth, Beth, had a question too. Beth had a question for you, Sal. Yeah. Go ahead. Beth. And unmute. I'm unmuted now. All right. Um, looking at this calendar, April 14th, are we going to be able to use those as an ex exhibitions? Well, um, keen eye. So that's, that's, that's why it's there. Um, and, you know, we've done some re research over the last couple of years, and uh, we believe that um, we can make a justification that if, uh, and, I've, and I've met with the senior team, there's probably a few on the call here. Um, we think that we can, um, in their, the last time I sat with them last year in terms of using it, they, they didn't, although years ago it used to be an early dismissal and that didn't give them enough time, a full day may be a little too much. So we had talked about perhaps like we've done in the past, um, maybe an hour or two of professional development and then a, an exhibition day or maybe an hour or two of um, remote learning and then an exhibition day. So I think, uh, again, once we have more clarity as to what our flexibilities are for next year, but that's strategic why, strategically why it's there. Um, and are, are we doing exhibitions this year or are they? So um, hold that thought. You're going um, to learn more about that in the coming days. Um, I need to have a conversation with the board for, and um, I will tell you that the senior team uh, John and I, we met on Monday morning, and um, uh, there's, there's some things that, that we're going to have to consider, because it, although last year, um, you know, we did not end up having in-person um, senior exhibitions, understandably, we were kind of thrown into a tailspin. This year has been difficult for students, too, and there's some, some unique challenges I want to share with you guys, because uh, I need some feedback. Any other okay. questions? Any other questions for Sal? So that was a very lengthy superintendent's report. Thank you. All right, we'll move right along to uh, board committee reports. I think the finance committee is the only uh, committee that um, had gotten together since the last meeting. And I'm sure for Pat, uh, Mike probably covered it, but Matt, uh, Pat, do you have any uh, anything to add? Actually, I do. Um, and you know, you probably saw it, saw it on the consensus agenda and probably wondered why. Claims monitor. Um, a couple of weeks back, um, uh, Mike and I were uh, Mike notified us that the claims monitor has uh, was retiring, and even the claims monitor for a number of years. And of course, um, some years ago. Uh, the board delegated its responsibility for reviewing uh, vouchers prior to payment uh, to the claims monitor. And uh, every July during the organizational meeting, we appoint the claims auditor by name. 
Well, I went back to look at the po our policy that we have, and um, you know, there's some due diligence uh, that we need to, we needed to do. So I started asking some questions, and it turns out the um, claims auditor is actually uh, Questar. It's not really by you know the individual person. We actually contract with Questar. So um, um, might clarify that um, and uh, some of the other questions we had um, in, in the finance committee uh, regarding it. So that is why, you know, uh, at this point in time, we're uh, appointing, uh, recommending uh, appointment of Questar as the claims auditor. Uh, so this is a policy committee uh, um, report as well as a audit committee. I'm sorry? This is a policy committee report as well as well no it's a finance committee report <laughs> and well it's the only because there, there there is an existing policy oh okay all right we are trying to comply with and make, make sure that we understood what the what the uh, that we were doing our due diligence uh regarding the you know and following what the policy required what well, um, i don't i don't think he's uh probably on and probably is uh, enjoying his retirement by now, but I wanna thank uh, Rich Diaz as our uh, auditor. Uh, he's done a great job over the years and uh, uh, thank him and hopefully his predecessor does as well. So I just wanna, you know, I did wanna clarify why we have it on the consensus agenda tonight in case anybody was wondering. But that would be it. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All right. I'm moving to, uh, I, I, I do have to uh, say that the sport should be aware that uh, Lisa is uh, reserving her time to speak. So the future of uh, hearing from Lisa, she reported that to me the other day and I noticed that she had no comments tonight. So <laughs> thank you, uh, Lisa Rudd. Um, but be right. prepared for so the I'm gonna, opens up. I'm going to embarrass Lisa. Lisa's birthday is today. So oh, my. I'm not, not going to force I everybody to sing happy birthday. That. But we're just going to, we're going to just wish her a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Lisa. Thank you. She just turned four shades of red too. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do that to her because she's been quiet. So no good deed goes unpunished when you have to spend your birthday on a board at a board meeting. <laughs> um, Mariel, you have anything? Uh, happy birthday! I can do a shuffle ball change. We can. We'll, we'll do that okay. just as soon All as right. we're just as soon as we're in person. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, we're going to uh consensus R46 be it resolved board of education except the consensus agenda H through J as written. Can I get a motion? Motion, can I get a second? Second, Pat was second. Um, I didn't catch who was first. Yes, I was. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? I'm going slow for Teresa. Uh, uh, e Craig, I actually had a quick question on that one. Go ahead. Questions or comments? <laughs> yeah. Um, still in favor, but uh, I was hoping Chuddy was available to chime in on the budget transfer. Mike, I, I I saw he went black, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure he. Oh, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the budget transfer that was for the CARES Act. Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we did is, <clears throat> typically, a lot of times when you get the federal money, it's in the federal aid account, and you have to move the teachers over to the federal fund. Um, we clarified with the accounting of it; they actually want to see it in the general fund. So all I'm doing for reporting purposes, and I put the teachers back in their normal positions and I budgeted that way. So we were okay with that. 
but for reporting purposes, they want to, sh it's good to show that line for those teachers that were pulling out in the federal fund. So the budget doesn't change. It's the same budget. I'm just moving the, it's in the same codes. I'm just making a CARES Act code to, to show that teacher, those teachers. Okay, thanks. Yep. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> no, I just want to, um, you know, again, uh, I, just think, and maybe that's where you're going, Craig. Yeah, I'm going to Okay, there. I'm going to let you take it then. Uh, I want to thank, uh, typically these, this would be an I-2 and an I-3, and these people deserve better than that. So I-2, I want to thank Jim Flanagan, 32 years with Chatham Central School. It's incredible. Uh, I-3 doesn't sum up Patrice Tomasi. Uh 41 years. Wow. We're talking about 73 years of education at Chatham. This is incredible. Uh, I want to thank them. Um, it, it, you know, I don't, I, I, I didn't even really pre prepare much more than that, but uh, if anybody's got any comments. Uh, no, I just want to um, also throw, I want to thank them. I want to throw Lucy in there too, 14 years um, as a teach, uh, teaching assistant also uh, helped us out tremendously during COVID um, in working uh, on the, in the child care program and our collaboration with, with kids club. So we really um, appreciate, we appreciate all of our, our teachers and we don't, we, we wish them well, but we don't want to see any of them leave. No, no, it's a uh, consensus and, and it's personal. Well, and <clears throat> it's usually uh, one of those things where we are cautious on saying names on most of these uh, locations, but this one, I'm not cautious on saying names. And I, uh, I, I want to congratulate them and thank them for everything they've done for Chatham. And I did, Destiny did have her hand up um, next. So Destiny. Yeah, I don't think I could put into words the impact that Mr. Flanning and, and Ms. Tommaso have had on Chatham students. I texted my friend group who, we would literally hang out in the art room in homeroom for three years from freshman year to junior year, telling them Mrs. Tommaso is retiring. And after seeing Ms. Harrigan go, uh, we were emotional. It was an emotional night in, in a group chat last night. So yeah, the I mean, our town teachers really, truly the best, but Mr. Flanagan and Mrs. Tommaso are one, amazing and I could get gone, but I'll leave that at that. Thank you. Uh, Beth? Who I, I missed it. Um, who was the third teacher who had put in for retirement earlier? The teacher I mentioned? Was yes. a teaching assistant. Lucy. Oh, okay. Richard. I didn't have it right. Okay. Uh there's any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Shout out to uh, Terry. How you doing? Keeping up? Deb made me promise that I would uh, go easy on you. Okay. We're going to uh, future agenda. Any board members have any items for future agenda? I see Beth's hand up, but I think she just didn't put it down. But um, I've got some stuff to uh, talk about for our future agenda items. Gladys Cruz um, with Questar uh, has approached us to um, – we typically every year have – invite them in for a board meeting to go over – some of the stuff um, in the past that's been budget kind of items. Um, I, you know, uh, I'm not so keen on the budget items. Everybody has their opportunity to look at. It. And if anybody uh, looks at the quest star budget and has any questions or concerns, they can reach out to me and we can uh, follow up on it. But um, they do have some neat programs coming up. Um, Unfortunately, uh, I got to say, uh, one of them is pretty exciting for me. It's uh, an ag program. It's uh, basically um, uh, 
uh, farm to the table type program. And uh, anybody in ag, and I know I have some attendees that are totally into ag. And uh, um, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear about it. Unfortunately, like their heavy construction, it was out of our area. So I'm not positive if it suits us, but it would still be interesting you know, possibly interesting to hear about. And, and maybe Gladys has got some, uh, some other things. So I wanted to see what the board thought about inviting our Questar leader to a board meeting. Um, <coughs> I'm all for it when we get back in person. <coughs> uh, back in person. Yeah, when the board's meeting back in person. Okay. instead of on zoom um, that's my opinion yep okay matt you have your hand up yeah i mean i um in person sounds great as long as we're not waiting six months i i'm i'm excited to to hear from them um but i i have a request which is i'd like them to prepare remarks uh on what they're going to be able to offer in terms of programming um on a remote format uh, it's been a disruptive year for everyone um and Unlike some of our Questar brethren, we're out at the end of our transport runs, right? Um, if they have the ability to take any of that programming virtual, I want to hear about it. All right. You know, I know that's on, on their minds, so I think that's great. Uh, and perhaps we could, um, we, uh, if, we, when we, if and when we invite them, we could maybe make a short list of questions to let them prepare. Um, because Craig and I have talked, you know, the, the program he's referring to, is a real nice extension of that heavy equipment program down in, in um, Carol Durham donated the building to Questar. And so now that they have people running heavy equipment, they're gonna add you know, an animal and a plant um, a component to it and even a culinary. So truly farm to table, but it doesn't make much difference what they offer if our kids can't access it. Um, and so discussions in terms of how they might be able to provide full day programming or um, help us, you know, uh, for our kids to have an equal access to those programs. The other one, Matt, that you'll probably be interested in, um, and, and uh, Dusty could speak better to that program, New Visions um, program, which, uh, Dusty, correct me, you went to the political science piece of it, right? There's also a STEM one that is an articulation with RPI. Um, there's a medical one, and they're going to add a brand new one, just as the SUNY um, uh, new SUNY program uh, is opened up for uh, Homeland Security and Cybersecurity. They're going to yeah. have a new visions uh, program that articulates with SUNY Albany in that area, which I thought was really exciting. So uh, I think it's great to potentially invite them here. They also have, um, uh, you know, they could at that point they can update the board on where they are with Tech Valley High School and some other programs like Early College. They have a grant for Early College and for P Tech that they're going to be working with at Hudson Valley. So they, they've really, um, you know, have, have some new things that might be of interest to the board. So this is the point where we've heard a few things. We can fine tune uh, her their report because they're going to ask us to because it's so broad. Um, but I guess the first question is, um, would we like to schedule, I heard Muriel, when we're in person, we don't know when that'll be, but we would like to uh, schedule uh, Questar to uh, speak at one of our uh, next meetings, upcoming meetings. I think that's a great idea. Okay. I will tell you that they've been making the rounds virtually to some other districts. So I think they, they've given this new, given COVID there, they've become accustomed to having to attend some of the meetings virtually. So the board's, the board's preference, um, and I'll do, and I'll reach out to Glass with whatever, whatever your wishes are. I I think that we should take advantage of whatever the information if if we want to hear from Questar and see Gladys, um, and then they're always available at our request to come back and speak on behalf of other programs and stuff. So um, I think it would be. Go ahead. You're. Uh I remember uh, several years ago, um, this came up and we we're always very open to this, but we, anything that we really wanted to hear, just like Matt just said, we wrote down, gave it to our superintendent 
And then the superintendent was able to tell Quest, tell Gladys and the people what we were interested in here. So they don't come in and get blindsided by, by things that they're not ready to discuss. Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. Do we and have a what, And that's what happened. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So my first, first part question a would be, do we feel we should hear from Questar? If we're all unanimous yeah. in that, then yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Question B is we'll work on a subject matter or subject matters so they're prepared when they come to us. Yes. Is everybody good with that? Yeah. Yes. yes. And we'll we'll go through Sal on that. Mm -hmm. And uh and uh we'll come up with some, you know, we'll you can I'll, email. Um, yeah, I'll start Just email Sal. Yeah. yeah. I'll um I'll make sure that I make a note of that in the Friday report as well. Um I'll start reaching out to Gladys to see what their availability is and see how they match up to some of our meeting dates. And then, um, you know, what I have right now, um, selfishly, I'd like to hear about their new programs. Um, I've seen part of the presentation. Um, I've got notes on, Matt would like to know um, how they're able to um, uh, provide a remote um, option to that. And, and I wanna know um, how they might be able to take an existing in-person program and make it more accessible and make maybe there is a remote component to that but i want i'd like to specifically have them address transportation challenges and logistics challenges yeah and and muriel on your uh, concern i actually feel that and you've been a part of many of these um uh i think that remotely she could probably put together an easier team than when they used to come in person yeah um uh, for a, a wide wider scope of uh, concerns, questions, or uh, things we want to be knowledgeable about. So um, maybe the first step would be hoping that we're remote. And then uh, if we want to follow up on stuff, I, I assume we're going to be uh, in person here real soon. But um, so we'll work on this. And uh, it's always nice to hear about them. But I think we're all in agreement. We if anybody wants to worry about the Questar's budget, BOCES budget, um, they can do it on their own and they can uh, send con questions or concerns to us because that that night was terrible. And I think even Mike Chuddy would agree if he's done eating. The Reader's <laughs> Digest version is they've done a nice job of keeping most of their costs flat and very reasonable. And um, you know, Mike and Lisa are going to sit down and look at, at the, um, I think it's the SR7, uh, just to see what our services are and, and make sure that we're still subscribing to what we want to subscribe to. But other than that, um, I'd rather them talk about program and exciting opportunities for kids. Thank you. And I know Lisa's just waiting, she's chomping at the bit to tell us about their budget. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picking birthday. one of you today. It's your birthday. <laughs> For what it's worth, Craig, their their annual meetings next month. Um, yeah. I'll be attending, and if any other board members want to join, I'm sure we can still get get them on the list. Yeah, I would. I would, I would like to. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, it was put out. I'm glad I sent out an email to everybody, and it's open to all board members. What if so I have if, Deb, uh, I'll have Deb resend that uh, that information. Yep. Um, That's great, Matt, because it, it is. If, if something's odd in there, we we should know about it. So that's, that's, that's great. great and last year it, it was virtual and it was pretty, um, um, it was pretty quick, it, you know, unlike when we go in person and it's nice because the culinary students provide our doors and, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, no, it's a, no, I wasn't, I wasn't going to go there, but yeah, it is in person was a nice uh, annual meeting. Yes. I'll tell Gladys she expect Grubhub to show up with some culinary students. <laughs> yeah. Why not? <laughs> yep. All right. We'll get Anybody on that. else have any items for uh, future agenda? I, I believe, um, you know, so, uh, so we'll work on that for everybody. And we usually give them that at least once a year. Maybe we have to go back twice a year this year. And uh, I'm good with that. So we'll set that up relatively soon. And uh, so, like I said, once again, anybody that has any other questions or concerns, if they overlap, that'd be great. And uh, 
we'll get them in to either me or Sal and uh, we'll let Gladys know what, what we're expecting and we'll get back to you guys on that. It's good timing. Um, our counselors and principals have been invited to a lunch and learn this Wednesday on some of the new programs. So um, Gladys is reaching out, reaching out on the instructional side to try to make uh, our counselors aware of what some, some of the options are as well. You know, to be honest, um, in our attendees, hate to call them attendees, but it's general. But um, if there's anything else out there that anybody uh, is uh, questioning or concerned about, I would like to uh, have them email in too. You all have my email and you have Sal's email. But if you'd like to hear about something that's offered, uh, that'd be great. So I'm opening it up to more than the board. Our whole uh, family here. So, because if it concerns some of our attendees, it concerns the board. And I did see a hand flash up. I don't know who it was from, but we are going into a uh, second public comment. So now's your time. Um, if you have any questions or comments. Um, Judy has a comment. I'm going to promote her to a yeah. panelist. Thank you. Give her a second. Yep. Judy, you should be um, live if you'd like to unmute your microphone. Hello, Judy. Okay, there I am. <laughs> hey. Um, I would like to speak for the Chatham Area Silent Pantry, and we'd like to thank the community for making the donation to the pantry at school outreach possible. We look forward to helping the students with their critical needs other than food. We did receive generous donations and we thought, how can we help the community? And so we're excited about this new, <clears throat> new prospect. I'd also like to thank Mike Chuddy. He did a bunch of work for it to get this, this project off the ground, the guidance counselors and the social workers for making this work. I also like to let you know that we plan to reassess the program in June to determine its, set, its success and whether another contribution would be needed for next year. We're hoping to make this a continuing program. Uh, of course, that is dependent on our financial status, but we would like to continue this relationship with the school. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Judy, for everything you've done and continue to do. It's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Is anybody out there in our attendees list? Have any comments or questions for us? Okay. I know you all know how to raise your hand now because I've taught you guys often. So we're going to go back to uh, closing out this uh, meeting. Um, any questions from you, Terry? We all good? All right. Thank you so much for filling in for Deb. And uh, my pleasure. Thank you. We're going to, uh, I'm going to ask for a motion to uh, enter executive session. So, so moved. We have Muriel and Beth. Any, uh, All right, so we're going to appoint uh, Sal for district pro temp, district clerk pro temp. Uh, motion. 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 Second. second. Destiny, second. And I do not um, anticipate returning to the open session. We will not be conduct conducting any uh, business or voting on any items uh, so thank you all for attending and everybody knows how to switch over right everybody got that yep from yep. the email from sal's email yep so we're going to close out of this session and we're going to switch over to the other session and we'll see you there <laughs>